thing that you don't they don't prepare you for is I didn't know I was gonna get so much stick. I've been obliterated since I turned pro. You're from Burton, and that was where you boxed Anthony Joshua in, yeah, in yeah. Burton Town Hall. I said it before. He looked like he'd be, he looked like he'd done five years in jail. He was a massive <laughs> crowd, just like went oh. Really? Yeah, it was, it, was, it was frightening, honestly. It was a frightening, frightening boy back then. I can't sleep at night knowing people think that I, I Fraser Clark, would, would have pulled out of that fight. And I want to see, I want to prove to them why I wouldn't have. Today, Deck, we have a, well, another heavyweight in the club. Collecting them. Uh, he's an Olympic medalist. He has a perfect record. And he's also known as Big Frage. I can't, I struggle to say that. <laughs> phrase, 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 phrase. Not phrase. Yeah, it's not like phrase, phrase yeah, is it? Bit, I get that a bit, but yeah. it's phrase. Oh, it's, it's Fraser Clark. Yeah, Fraser Clark. J Fraser. I can't say it. <laughs> Jesus. I'll tell you what, I was sort of reading up on a couple of articles and I thought your name was going to be The Eraser. Was you yeah. ever the Eraser? I don't know. Fraser, Wiki, the Wikipedia the eraser. started that. You know, Did Wikipedia really? used to have the maddest things on it. And then someone sent me this one day, is your name the Eraser? I've never heard this. And then I said, look on Wikipedia, I've looked. Fraser the Eraser Clark. And then I think on my debut, it got announced as the Eraser. <laughs> but I, did, like, I, I just said, it's just a bit corny for don't me. Don't like me. it, no? Mm. I don't like we it. We were Eraser. How, how'd you come up with Big Phrase? <laughs> <laughs> one of them, isn't it? It's like, it's never, it never, um, that wasn't a nickname. My nickname was always Fraz. Oh yeah, like France for you, and then you're doing fuck that, George. Yeah, yeah, you've been struggled, and then all of a sudden, um, I think it was the GB coaches. Big phrase, big phrase. It just thought. All right, France. Yeah. So um, what are we talking about, George? So, we had so much to go at here with Fraser because so we could have we could have done five different episodes. Luckily, we're not. We're just going to do one. <laughs> but what what did you land on? So What's I quite like like navigating yourself to the top of the division in the heavyweight scene, like which you know we know you're on the journey as such. So. I think it'd be fascinating for listeners to know what you're thinking and feeling, what you've been for already, and what your you know your plan or route is mm. in time to come. You haven't got to answer that like right yeah, now. That's okay. 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 <laughs> so, so yeah, if you don't mind, yeah. for the next hour. But it's, it's a different beast, isn't it? The heavyweight, the heavyweight landscape, and, and navigating that, particularly from your like start from your start, which was obviously the big amateur background and the amateur pedigree, which and you've come into the professional sport with as much as anyone in terms of experience, particularly as a heavyweight. Let's start with the amateurs. Well, Cause we were, we could do an episode on GB with you because you were there that long, you know it inside out. What, um, what did you take from that grounding as a, as a, as an amateur boxer? Because we know it's a different sport, but you know, how transferable is it? I think it helped me in terms of knowing like a little bit of, of the pro background because Believe it or not, the last few years, I'd say the gap closed a little bit in the amateurs and the pros. Um, I've heard people talk about the, it's a point scoring thing. Now, when George was boxing, it was it was very much um, point scoring. But over the last four or five years, they they want to see a, aggression. They want to see presence in the ring. And, and the point scoring thing, if you actually look at it now uh, in, the, in the big competitions, it's not a thing. Obviously, you, you got the 10-9 round. So the gap is actually closer now than it was mm. so i think that was what i learned first and foremost that like the 10 9 rounds how to do how to win them as an amateur and obviously that transfers over to the pro game um but then obviously um rob mccracken was our head head coach and he was had a lot of experience in the pros obviously we trained around frotch and and joshua so we was never too far away from it anyway so you i was always picking up little bits and bobs I used to watch, obviously, them guys train all the time, just see how they conduct themselves. And I was a bit of a sponge. Mm -hmm. That Let's explain to the listeners there. So the te so when you were boxing as an amateur, it was literally point scoring. So like you would land with a scoring part of the glove on the head or the body and you would get one if all the judges pressed a button within a second of each other, whatever it was. And so then you could just run away with it and you, you win like 10-1 or whatever it was over the course of the rounds. But then when you were there at the elite level, it was literally like 10, nine rounds like professionals do. So then there's judges scoring at ringside who score, Fraser Clark's won that round 10, yeah. loser gets nine and so on. So more, far more professional. And yours was so detached from what you would then have to do as a, as a professional, wouldn't it? Yeah. So how would you win a round um, as an amateur boxer? Is it, was it like, like because we don't even know this in the pros, like is it whoever lands the biggest shots, the most shots, controls the ring, or would they keep it to point scoring, but just on a round by round basis? So 
I, 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 like I said, I was there for that long. I started with the point scoring stuff as well. And then you had the gloves with the white tip on the end. And then all of a sudden they got like banished. And that was, they were like designed to help the judges detect who's scoring the point. Um, so the answer to that is we was, I was always a believer in throwing more shots than your opponent, being busier. And we always, I think it's pretty much the Great Britain way was to push people back and you be the aggressor. But then obviously you box some nations, example, the Cubans, they, they'd win on the back foot by throwing single shots and scoring them points. So it really was a subjective thing, but I'd always go with, it always changed depending on who you were boxing. But it's pretty much the same as a professional round, you know, dominance and it really should be, especially I think in the amateurs, it should be whoever lands the most clean shots. But it just didn't seem to work like that at times. You know, I'm sure you remember when you were boxing. Can you remember there was that period where people used to just stand there, like in a ball, and like just counter with one shot and nick a point. I think they were trying to get rid of that. So in the end, um, there was so much that came into it. It'd be like who's controlling the the, the bout, who's throw, who's landed the most shots, who's landed the bigger shots. It become a bit confusing, you know, towards the end on how do you actually <laughs> like what do they want to see because. In one bite, you'd see a Cuban on the back foot throwing 50 shots at a fight, and that's over all three rounds, and nicking shots here and there. And then you'd see um, middleweight Ukrainian Kizniak, I think his name was, who just relentlessly just went at people and threw a million shots. So in the end, it just became a bit difficult on what are they actually wanting to see. Mm. Mm. Did you... <laughs> Um, you did World Series of Boxing as well, didn't you? So that yeah, was yeah. five rounds yeah. and even more closer like to the professional. Did yeah. you do that because it was just a clear like stepping stone between the amateurs and the pros or was it just a good opportunity at the time? And obviously that was before, that was before the Olympics, wasn't it? <sighs> The honest truth is I did that because it was 1,500 quid. <laughs> and that, and that was like, that was, I think it was 1,500 quid for a win, 500 quid for a loss. And then when it, when, when it first started, you had a monthly retainer as well. So I think that was 1500 quid as well. So when you're on the GB setup and you're getting paid X amount, you could like double your yearly income from these WSB bouts. So I never said no to one. I took, I think I had nine, nine and oh. That Lionhearts you were boxing. Lionhearts, yeah, yeah. I took every single fight away against Cuba, Ukraine in, in this country, Russia in this country, I just took them all, no problem, because I wanted the money. <laughs> so say say you get 1,500 for a win, so it's like a thousand pound win bonus. Yeah. Was that motivation for you then? Oh yeah, like... Which obviously, would, you still nothing. have it as an amateur, like, but you're not getting paid, you win, lose or draw, you, you either don't get paid or you still get your sort of uh, bursary or salary through GB or whatnot. But there's a thousand pound bonus. On oh, this. <laughs> like that was, it's still a lot of money, but it was so much money, you know, to all, all the lads on the squad, it was like, let's go in this WSB. Like, because we all got asked as a collective, whatever you want to do it. And then once they told us the money, <laughs> every, every, everyone was just like, yeah, we'll do that. No problem. You had people going, going to like crazy countries to fight beast in these little gloves. But even, even, even the, the loss bonus was, was a lot of money to the people. So people would fight at the drop of a hat. Mm. It's mad. I mean, would you fight for 1,500 quid now? Probably not, no. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the caliber opponent. Yeah, that that's what I mean, that, yeah. was, that, was, uh, that was the thing. Now, when I look back, I sort of laughed about it and think, oh my God, they've absolutely had my pants down. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Usyk boxed Joe Joyce, in it, at York Hall in that? Yeah. And Lomachenko and Sam Maxwell in that same night? They, they all got 1,500 quid. Really? <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> and that was five twos, wasn't it? Five threes. Five threes. Yeah. So again, for just another, like closer to what you would be doing as yeah, a pro. Yeah, bridging the gap. Yeah. When mm. you, so you spent a lot of time around Joshua in particular and Frotch and stuff. So when you turned over, how many tools do you think you had in the locker? Or how... Because some people will turn over almost blind to what that was coming. But did you feel like I know the score? I know what I have to do and what's required of me to get where I want to be. I thought that I did. <laughs> I thought I thought you got it sussed I, out. I thought I had it sussed. And then once you're actually in the pro boxing, the amateur background definitely helps a lot. You know, the thing that you don't they don't prepare you for is like I'll be honest, I didn't know I was going to get so much stick. I've been a, I've been obliterated since I turned pro. I thought I've come back from the Olymp Olympics. I've won a bronze medal. 
everyone's going to love me and support me. That's that's not the case. I think that was the biggest thing I didn't expect. So I've had to really toughen up um, over the last 18 months. And I have done, luckily enough. Mm. Why Why do you think that is? I think there's, there's a bit of expectation. You know, you come from the Olympics and I think when... Anthony Joshua and Joe Joyce were the ones that were were in front of you. They they were the last Olympic medalist in my weight division. And they've obviously, Joshua was just obliterating everyone. Joyce went at a really fast pace. People have expectations. But like I've said to a lot of people, we're, we're different fighters with different styles. And I'm sure my journey is going to be different to theirs. Um, and other than that, you know, like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think, doing all the presenting I've obviously I've been on Sky quite a bit and I've been pushed forward I've been in, the, in front of the cameras a lot and um, yeah I think people just don't like the fact that the fights I've had as well they haven't some of them haven't helped the matchmaking but I also think I've made it look easy I, I, I don't think I've got out of first gear as a pro yet I really haven't struggled at all with the people I've been boxing because I believe I was boxing a, a bigger and higher caliber of fighters as an amateur if that makes sense. Mm. You you got some credit early doors when you were you you were like criticizing the the matchmaking. You finish and you win and you'd be like, it's not good enough. I need better. I think people appreciated that. Well, it was it was just the truth, like yeah, yeah, yeah. But then again, I understand it from everyone else's point of view and perspective. Like Joe Joyce was the one that sort of broke the mold in terms of he was he come mm. out of the gates flying. He boxed Lewis on his debut, on his didn't debut. he? So I think people were expecting that of me, but. Um, I was under no illusion that this is a new game and I needed to improve. Whereas I think Joe was a little bit older than me when he turned pro. And I think that he was probably more suited to pro boxing than I was. So, you know, I think everyone's got a difference in opinion, difference in style. And you just go at your own. What I've learned now is you just do your own thing in this in this, in this uh, pro game. Go at your own pace and do what's what's most important for you. You're training now with uh, Angel Fernandez, yeah? yeah? And uh, how did that come about? Like, because obviously you're in the GB setup, but you said that lots of the stuff you're doing is almost pro-ish and you've got Ron McCracken, who's former pro, tra trained pros. Um, what was you looking for in, in a co pro coach? Or did you even know at that point? No, I, wonder. I didn't really know. But it was, obviously the Olympics happened in lockdown. And I can remember Loughborough, it was only... 25 minutes from where I live. Nice. And I can remember um, I seen I seen a story of Richard Rappaport training the gym on his own. And I was down the road and the, the the lockdown restrictions had been lifted. So I think I dropped him a message and said, look, is there any chance I can come and use the gym? Um, it's down the road from me. I'm punching a bag in my garage. The walls are shaking in the house. My missus is getting on my case. <laughs> so then he's like, yeah, no no worries. I spoke, dropped the angel a message. He said, yeah, let's go, go down. That's no problem. And it was basically just to lose the lockdown weight and, and get in some sort of condition to go back to GB. So I started going once or twice a week. And then obviously, you know, once you start um, once you start training with people and that re relationships build and then eventually started, you know, oh, do you want to come on the pads? And I'll do a little bit of pads. And then I was like, having a bit of sparring down there and stuff. And then we just formed a relationship from that really. Um, and the thing is, obviously I was in Sheffield and... I probably could have stayed at Sheffield because a few of the guys have done that. Lauren, Karis, Gilal, they're still there. But I'd felt I'd been there for so long and I loved the place, but I literally couldn't even stand the, the floor anymore. Like I'd walk in that gym. You know when you've been in, in and out of that gym for 12 years, it was just... Couldn't stand no, the I floor. No, I couldn't stand it anymore. And like the, the colour scheme in the gym was, I was literally at a stage <laughs> where... And red, didn't it? Yeah, I was literally at a stage where I felt I needed a change. I was so comfortable. I had... Lots of friends in Sheffield had lots of um, opportunities to to distract myself from boxing, so I just felt it was it was time to be a bit of a big boy and have a change because I was mother cuddled for twelve years up there. Do you know what I mean uh, the coaches and the support staff did everything for me, and I just thought if I'm going to turn into a professional, I probably need to take some of the onus on myself and uh, and move away and yeah, grow up there. Mm. And you're from Burton, from right? Burton, you live do you live there now. Yeah, or just outside. And that was where you boxed Anthony Joshua in, yeah, in yeah. Burton Town Hall. Uh, yeah, Burton, um, like one of the little centres. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how long ago was that? That was 2009. So a long time. Yeah, long time. I remember speaking to Sean Murphy about that night and he said that when they turned up, apparently, you probably correct me if I'm wrong, 
but your coaches wanted to do three minutes because you were elite at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, no, nah, no, nah, we've got to do two minutes. Because yeah. it was like his third bout, whatever it was. Yeah, so. I think I think, I think it's like, it had less than five anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wanted to do the threes. And then I, when I seen him, I thought, for fuck's sake, <laughs> like, I, I honestly, God, I was so little and fat. And he was just, I said it before, he looked like he'd, be, he looked like he'd done five years in jail. He was massive. Um, and yeah, we walked out and the crowd just like went, oh. Really? Yeah, it was it was it was frightening. Honestly, it was a frightening, frightening boy back then. Yeah, and you did so you did three twos. At three that twos, point. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he just flew at me. Really? You know, like one of them. My head got come flying off in the first minute. A gum shield come flying out, and you know you go back going back to my corner. I come in my coach and I go, get out there, get stuck in. I'm thinking, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> did you know at that point were you like he's he's special? He's he's gonna go all the way. Yeah, uh, I didn't know. He, the obviously, I didn't know he'd go as far yeah, as go. Yeah. But, I knew, um, I think the ABAs were coming up. I think I'd won them, the, I think I'd won them the year before or something like that. And I thought, I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna meet this guy again. Uh, turns out I was, I went into a tournament with GB, so they pulled me out of the ABAs and I went overseas somewhere. Anyway, I ended up winning them that year. And then he come onto the squads. And once he come onto the squad and I was already on there, the like within the first week, the improvement he made in like one week of being around the coaches and training like two, three times a day. I knew the writing was on the wall for me. He was just literally going at a, a, a rapid rate. So, you know, and obviously he did what he did. He just he just flew, went from strength to strength to strength. How how hard was that for you as like as the as someone who were like, I want to be the number one here? And then someone turns up, you're like, for fuck's sake. Like he's like they're earmarking him early doors. It was it was just like a massive wake up call. Like I think in the amateurs a lot of people think they're better than they are. And I definitely, I was definitely in that category. Like I thought I was, but I was not an athlete at all. Um, I'd been boxing in England, club shows, uh, national championships, done a little bit um, around Europe with England. And he was just a different level. He was, I've never, I'd never seen an athlete like him. And I still probably haven't to this day in, mm. in, the, in amateur boxing. So it was just a massive wake up call and uh, it actually did me well. I actually improved once Joshua came in, even though I was a little bit gutted inside. But now when I look back and, and I'm realistic about it, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have won one bout of that at the London Olympics. I wasn't good enough. Every every single other fighter in there was better than me at the time. Mm. Whereas Rio was different. I was gutted in Rio because I think out of the 16 super heavyweights, I'd, I'd beaten 13 or 14 of them in the run up to Rio. So I felt like I was good enough to go there and compete. So that was that was more when Joe Joyce got picked for the qualifier. That was more gutting than when AJ got picked for Lon the London qualifier. Well, he qualified at the world. So when he got picked for the worlds and he did so well, I sort of knew that like, there's nothing I could do about that. Mm. So what what was what happened there with the setup where Joyce got picked for the qualifier instead of you? Did you have to have a box off beforehand or anything like that? We boxed in the ABA final. And, and he beat me 2014, I think. And I was just playing catch up from them. So he was select. So we're both in the, in the ABAs, we both got to the final, boxed each other. And then obviously any major he went to, so he went to the Europeans, medaled. I could go to all the, the little tournaments, the Tama, the GB tournament. I went there, I won gold. I had a really good run 2015. Didn't lose about one, I think I won like six gold medals on the bounce. But Joe was also winning all, all of his bats. He was going to the Worlds and meddling, going to the Europeans and meddling, Commonwealth Games and winning it. So I was always playing catch up, but I could never quite catch him because he, he was just doing so well. And in fairness, once again, like he probably should have won it. He got the silver medal. So I couldn't, in the end, I couldn't argue with it. Even when I went to, I went to like, I didn't have to go. I went to McCracken and I had a, like, said like, what, you know, I'm going to get a chance. He's like, look, he's like, you're doing fantastic. And I really want you to keep it up. But, look at Joe's resume, like he can't not go sort of thing. Like, you know, if, if you wanted to appeal it, you're never going to get a look in because he just winning medals in all the majors, mm. which is fair enough. Mm. It is that feeling of like, you're just a number on a sheet. You know, there's like- there's no, you know all about that, didn't you? Well, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, nowhere near as like um, intense as your story, but yeah, you know, it's like, we just need someone to go and win a medal. Yeah. We don't really care who <laughs> it is. 
no, so don't take it personally um, and if he's going to the major tournaments you're not even going to the major tournaments to show okay. you, you're in you're in with a shout so yeah it's tough it's tough you do learn a lot but difference for me was like it was amateur boxing when I was there yeah. and it was like you know point scoring four two minute rounds They every, they, everyone had to fight like Amir Khan like Amir Khan showed you the blueprint, blueprint of winning yeah, yeah. you know um point score in boxing and then if you couldn't fight like Amir Khan your days were numbered yeah. Uh, so yeah and you're better off turning pro than staying in that system for more than a cycle which is like four mm. years and neither of you can even complain because they were everyone was successful like well, James went and got the gold and then you're like yeah. oh shit I can't even moan now yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I think I was too much of a team not too much of a team player but I was so because I'd been there for a long, long period of time at that point I was so adamant on the team going and doing well and getting medals. I went out to Rio and I was, I was helping Joe prepare. I was, I would, I was, I would have been the water boy for the whole team. I would have given everyone water if they needed water. I would have gone and if people needed to go on a walk and didn't want to be alone, I would have gone with them because I just wanted the team to do well. And I think that's because the coaches, I know how much it meant to them, and the coaches meant a lot to me. You grow close. I was with these people more than I was with my parents over the last 10, 12 years. So. I knew how much it meant to the system that we get them. We like, we have a medal target and I just wanted the team to do well. So the coaches could do well, just so the program could do well. And I think I was just a GB company man. You know, <laughs> seven, yeah, I, just, I just wanted them wanted to do well, I really did. Mm, so that kind of then explains what you said about going to Loughborough and having to leave Sheffield. Was what, what was it like in that gym, early days in the lockdown period when it's like, was it, did it feel like a new lease of life for you? Was it, how different was it? Was it like, whoa, this is like a new world or was it much the same? Yeah, you know when, you, you, you might have experienced yourself, George, you know when you go to a, um, a different trainer and you think you're doing everything right and then they break you down and basically say like, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong and this wrong. It was something I hadn't heard for years. And I, like, I sort of like, wow, this is amazing. Like I left the gym and I thought, I've learned something there. And this is no no disrespect to anyone in GB and that, but I feel like because I was just in a system for so long, in a routine for so long, I probably stopped doing a bit of learning. I was just in there just doing the same thing, the same thing, the same thing. Whereas Angel broke it down, like your footwork, you know, the way you stand, the way you hold your hands, the positions you put getting yourself in, in the ring, the shots you throw in. And it made me think, and I really enjoyed like going back to school as such. And mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted more of that and more of that and more of that. Mm. yeah I can relate to that plus when you're on squad there's a lot more fighters you know they have a, lot, a collection of like trainers they might have more trainers in there now than I was when, when I was there but you don't ever really get that one-on-one -on -one time that you do as a pro like your pro coach um because then they come in and they break stuff down um you might change coach and the, and the new coach might it's tell you something different, different. Yeah. you're like well yeah. my old coach I don't know nothing <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but um in terms of that one-on-one -on -one time makes makes a massive difference um and that was what I was going to ask was like was that a big change for you going from amateur to now pro is almost like yeah what, what was the first thing you noticed was there anything you even noticed that maybe uh Richard was doing different to anyone else on the squad yeah I can just remember like the first, I think the first six or eight weeks, I didn't hit a bag or a pad. I was in front of like a mirror or I was in, in a ring shadow boxing and he wanted me to do things really slowly. And it was, it was really frustrating me because I, want, I wanted to do things at a faster pace, but I was literally walking up lines with my feet in the right position, you know, jabbing and make sure my hand come back to the right position really slowly, you know, for so long. And it's a bit like, you know, like Karate Kid, like you put the jacket on, you take it off. And I was just getting really frustrated, but I could see like what he, what he was doing um, and being alone. I've, I've been in a squad for so long around characters. Like the good thing about GB was there was always characters. Like there was the McCormack twins. There was uh, characters, uh, myself, Fowler, Cordina, Kez Ashfak, Charlie Edwards. There's just so many different different like characters all the time. It was, there was when you wasn't boxing, you was having a laugh. It was literally the best job in the world. And then I finished training in Loughborough. Another a new another pro comes in, and I'm, I go back to my hotel room. And I'm looking around like, well, what do we do now? Where's 
and no one's coming to the shopping centre. No one's going for a walk. <laughs> like I was on my own, do you know what I mean? And coach said, right, go back and rest because we'll be back in the gym this afternoon. And it was just like, it was just completely different. But I think I also needed that as well because I think when I look back to what we was doing on GB now, probably wasn't resting as much as we should have. Maybe we was getting up to too much stuff outside of boxing that that wasn't helping the boxing. Mm. Mm. So you, um, you're you managed by 258 yeah. and you're signed to Boxer, yeah. which guy. Um, how did that come about? Like, did you, did that, was it Angel Fernandez who said, speak to these guys or was maybe Joshua or anyone else? Yeah, so obviously I've I've known Joshua for years now. You know what I mean? I've always had good relationships with him. And I spoke to a lot of people beforehand about turning pro and management, not management and, and who and what and when. But I already had, think the truth is I already had the relationship with the guys from 258 because they was around Joshua so much and I was always sparring. Um, and when you are an, when you are a GB boxer or an international boxer, you are so, I think you sort of put off the pros because no one had a good word to say about it. <laughs> And you can't, don't trust anyone. That yeah, one, that go one. on, let's fill some beans. Yeah. Like, yeah, go oh, on. No, that was, they ain't got to throw names under the bus, like, or throw some names okay. under the bus. Basically, yeah, throw them basically. Like, send them under. So these are coaches maybe, or are they yeah, other fighters? Yeah, other fighters and coaches. In general, the the word on the street was, don't, don't get a manager. Don't get management. He says, don't get management. They're going to rip you off and do nothing. Um, really, yeah, yeah see, really interesting because you had lots of fighters, yeah. Like, yeah, don't, 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 you don't need a manager. Um, you, I was like, but then obviously, off some of the fighters who were turned pro, because remember, I've been in the cycle, and the the next guys who are my best friends that have turned pro, Anthony Fowler, Cordina, um, Josh Kelly, all them boys have turned pro, and they're saying something different. Oh, no, get management, it's good, man, they get you this, they get you that. So then your head's at a scramble because you trust mm. these people that are saying don't get a manager and you trust these people that are saying get a manager or management and then mm. you're all over the place. Um, but lucky enough, you know, I just felt like with the guys from 258, um, I'd already had a relationship with them anyway. Um, so I just said like, look, it, like, I need some help. Like I need helping out. Like I'm a little bit unsure of what to do here. And then I had good conversation with Ron McCracken as well because he was always my go-to for advice. Um, he always said to me, look, from from the day that we pretty much knew each other, when you do think, it, when I think it's time for you to go pro, I will tell you. When you do go pro, come talk to me before you talk to anyone. I'll give you my advice. Whether you take it or not is up to you, but I'm here to advise you if you need me to. And I, I really always appreciated that from Rob, do you know what I mean? And then when the time come, I was a little bit nervous to say, oh. I'm going to go and get some management role or I'm going to go and do this. I'm going to go and do that. But he was brilliant with me. He was, and he has been with the majority of fighters. He's put people in the right direction. A lot of them. Mm. What did you want to hear from 258 management that made you think, yeah, these are the guys to go with? Did you know? Or did the sign that they said that you didn't really know, expect to hear? I just, I think once again, you know, we've been on in that system and it's a bit embarrassing to say, but I think we was a bit mother cuddled, you know, like, Booking, booking a flight, booking. We just used to turn up at the airport. Uh, we just used to turn up at the hotel. I think I was kept a little bit of a child. Like I left, the, I left there at twenty nine when I left the program, and I'd not ever booked a flight. I'd not ever booked anything for myself. So I just, I think first and foremost, I wanted them to be organised for me and organise my sort of my life. Because obviously after the Olympics, I'd, I was having phone calls and emails and, and this and that and different opportunities popping up. And I just didn't know how to manage it, if I'm honest. I didn't have a clue. So that was that was the first thing. I think they could come in and help me manage everything that's getting thrown at me. There was opportunities I should have said yes to, things I should have said no to. Um, but then it soon turned to like my boxing. Like after, When you forget everything else, the commercial side of things, I was like focused on where am I going to go boxing-wise here? Like What's going to be my journey? What's going to be my route? And then obviously after sitting down, having some good conversations with a few different people, um, I just decided I felt more comfortable speaking to these guys because I'd already had that relationship. So it wasn't like speaking to like strangers. I felt like I was speaking to people that whether I work with them or not, 
we're gonna have the relationship either way. So it's tough to trust people, isn't it, at this stage? Like even even still, like you have that, especially when you're first doing pro. And this is my advice to everyone who is gonna turn pro from the amateurs or GB: just take like a second because there's that much information coming at you from that many different angles, and they're all slagging each other off. By the way, don't go and work with him; he's no good. Don't go mm. work with him; he's no good. You need you need that one person, I think, who you can rely on and trust it and say like yeah like that that's that if i was you i'd go that way no one that's going to dictate to you you should go and do that but just someone who you can trust who's got really good advice but that's difficult to find yeah so did they broker the deal for you for with boxer and sky well at, at this point i was i was still deciding on whether to have management or not so i'd half broken the deal myself <laughs> yeah. uh, i'd half got a little bit there which with, only with a few numbers here and there and then was that what Rob maybe told you to yeah do? Rob sort of had a few conversations for me and put me in touch with I think I, I went and spoke to everyone I went and spoke, mm. with, spoke with Frank Warren I went and sat down with Eddie and Barry um, so I'd have a few conversations I had a few emails coming in with a few different numbers on it and stuff and then to my what I was glad of was there was so many things in my contract that went in there once I spoke to these guys that I wouldn't have had a clue about it if not because I'm I'm off dyslexic. I can't really read it all right. So I, I would when I seen some of the numbers first, I would have signed the first the first deal because I had nothing. I come from I had no money. Fifteen hundred quid a fight. Yeah, yeah. I, you I, got I, to win it. I had no money. So when you see some some numbers on some paper to someone who's got nothing, I've got two young kids, and I would have signed straight away. It was nice to feel wanted. I don't care what profession you're in. You when you feel wanted. It's a nice feeling. Mm. Just picking up on the security thing, so in, in case our listeners didn't know that. So that's how I know you from years ago when you were a security guard at the box and you'd see, and you look at the old fights and you're in the background doing the security. Yeah. How did that come about? And you did Wembley, didn't you? Fox Gross too. Yeah, I had, a, I had a little wrestle with, you know, all the big meters you had with you. They were scary, <laughs> they were scary, they were scary yeah, fellas. Yeah, scary. Scary then, fellas. And I can remember uh, being told, I think it was the weigh-in, only two of them are allowed up the, the, the oh, some I stairs. That. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So then I was just young and naive and, and my boss Clifton at the time said, listen, two people coming down the stairs. So two went and then I stood firm. Oh my God, it was probably the biggest mistake I ever made. There was some heavy boys. You know, <laughs> they wanted, wanted in blood. Um, but yeah, it was just a good experience. That came about just because um, I was around 17, 18 and I was getting up to no good. And then I knew Clifton anyway, and and Simon who who also runs the security, and um, I think I seen him away in one day in my local town. There was a away in a small hall boxing show, and I was just causing trouble and just being a nuisance. And he said, "Right, you're doing your boxing night." I said, "Yeah, yeah." He goes, "Let me keep you like instead of Saturday nights being uh, causing trouble, come to the boxing shows with me, earn yourself a few quid, get around the environment, look at look at the boxing, look at a pro show. You might learn a thing or two along the way." So. I did it and I loved every minute of it. I, I know that I remember seeing like the photos and that of Joshua on the ring post, like celebrating and you're like right there. You're yeah. like in the middle, in the yeah. eye of the storm. He'd like, al al always like, obviously because I was doing this career, but the, the past six weeks, I was sparring with him three <laughs> yeah. times a week. So he'd always pull me up. Do you know what I mean? He'd always say, and I'd be like, a bit, I'd be like, I can't, I'm working. He'd be like, get in, get in. Like, <laughs> just, just pull me in the ring. <laughs> it's like, yeah, none of George's heavies are in this one tonight, come up. Oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't talk to Clifton for a few years after that one. I think you took it really personally. Okay. <laughs> Did he actually? Yeah, well, he come on suck because he, he... It was sort of you versus them, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, that's what he, he turned out like. Yeah, yeah. That's, that was you all over though, wasn't it, those but days? Yeah, yeah, well, like, it was like, oh, that's matchroom security. They're getting it as well, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I had some, yeah, some big boys, yeah, some on, big strong boys. On the subject of Sky because there was a lot of talk and conjecture about it at the time. You know what I'm go where I'm going and I'm sure you've answered this question a million times, but the purse bid situation. Ugh. Now we've got you here. Can we hear from your side of the story? Yeah, so Fabio Wardley, British heavyweight champion, yeah. the purse, the, the board call you as the mandatory challenger gets put into a purse bid situation. We've done purse bids on the pod before. If you don't know, listen to the Frank Smith episode. If you don't know what we talk about when we say purse bid, but then Sky pulled you out. Yeah. And you obviously wanted the fight. You're ready to fight anyone. What was your view of that? How did you feel at the time? And how do you feel now the dust has settled and you've moved on from that? What What was that whole situation like for you? So I've definitely learned a lot from it. But I can remember driving with my, I've got my, all I've got is my two kids in the car. I'm driving, my friend rings. 
um, have you seen have you seen your news? I said no. He said you've been made Monday on Instagram. You've been made mandatory for the British title. I pull over in a car park. I said you're joking me. I've looked. He said look, have a look. Sent me the the screenshot or whatever. I'm I'm ecstatic. I'm so happy. I turn around and tell my kids one six, <laughs> one six and one two. They don't have a clue both what's going asleep. on. Yeah, they're both just looking at me, gone out. Yes. I'm literally I'm literally jumping in, jumping up and down in the car. I'm so happy. Um, and then a few days go on, a few days go on, and then I'm hearing whispers and a call that, and and, and I'm having a few missed calls. I think I had a few missed calls off Ben Shalom. A message we need to speak. Uh, and then there was the show in Birmingham, the boxer show in Birmingham, and then they said, "All right, we we want you to uh, come down, and we we want a meeting." I've had a meeting with a few of the the heads from Sky and and, and boxer and whatnot. And basically, I knew what I was going in for anyway. I could, I could, you know, you just sort of get the gist. I got the feeling we don't think it's the right time for you to to fight for the British title. I'm distraught. I, I, I'm confident in myself. I, if Fabio Ward is the champion, I think I can beat him. I want to fight, but yeah, but you've not boxed so many, you've not done this over so many rounds. I think the gist was basically they didn't feel quite confident in winning the purse bid. Um, so that might have caused a bit of an issue for them. And then obviously I've been invested in, well, do you know what I mean? Um, my face is all over the place. There's a financial element of it. The last thing they wanted to do, I think, was lose one of their Olympians who they'd signed and they projected all over the place to go and box on um, the zone and match room. Yeah. So what what happens in that if 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 Dzone win the purse bid or Eddie wins the purse bid, you have no choice but to go and box on that show. Yeah. That's so, right. So so we had we had a discussion around the round table. Obviously there was they give all their reasons for for not wanting me to box. I gave my reasons for. I left that meeting. I walked out of that meeting, effing and, oh, and, yeah. and swearing. Yeah, because at the time I I thought you know this is this is something that I really want. Um, and then I think in it. Like I've had a lot of shit about you pulled out the purse bids. One hundred percent, I did not pull out the purse bids. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I you would. took you took the brunt of it. Like. I took the brunt of it, but I can assure you, and this is not throwing anyone under the bus, but it definitely wasn't me. Wherever the camera is, it one million percent was not me. It's not in my DNA. I wouldn't do it. But then, obviously, being a little bit naive to it. So who dropped the ball there? Because like, who? Because someone, someone, someone I, I can tell you, because they said that. Me and two five eight lobbied for to be put forward to the manager position, which we did, by the way. Uh, and then maybe me, I don't know, is that a bit of so was there like a miscommunication? miscommunication? Yeah, that's what possibly. But I think at the same time, we was we was told by a good source that the British um, heavyweight title purse bid is, and the mandatory position is going to be called in a few months' time. I think it was called like five days later. So I was hoping to have a 10 rounder in that period anyway, mm. and then be, then hopefully be uh, considered to be made mandatory. But it happened all within like a week. So it like, mm. it come around quick. And that point I hadn't had my 10 rounder, which I still wasn't, wasn't too concerned of. I was happy to just go in there and, and do it the other way and box Fabio next. I was happy to mm. do that. But yeah, I think miscommunication and then- Because the issue would still be there in terms of a purse bid, yeah. whether you'd had the 10 mm. rounder or not. Exactly. So, yeah, mm. was, well, I felt it, sorry for you at that point. Well, I, yeah. I, I took the brunt of it and it's actually made me, it's, it made me a lot stronger. You know, that was a dark few, dark, dark couple of weeks because I was taking the brunt of something that wasn't my decision. But then at the same time, I half understood where the other, like where the promoter and Sky were coming from in terms of they want me to do more rounds because I'd also spoke to a, people who I trust again and said, what, what do you think? And I was getting a few different opinions. Well, maybe you should do the rounds first, mate. And then other people say, no, you, you can take that fight tomorrow. That's no problem for you. You can take that. All things being said now, I took a lot of shit and I would have took the fight a million percent. But after doing a 10 rounds with whack, <laughs> I have to put a bit of egg on my face. I was probably glad. I think I did need to learn over the distance. I think I think it was it was a a, a rude awakening to ten rounds because I've done it in the gym a few, before. That, I did it in the gym a few times, and, but then doing it under the lights was was a little bit different. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So um, hot in there. I that think night every, as well. yeah, I think everything for a reason. 
but I would have took that fight nevertheless. So in terms of getting us to the top, I know we've run out of time, but to get you to the top, right? The next, the, like the next tick off the list will be whether it is a 50-50 matchup, but you to be involved in a build as a 50-50 matchup, whether that's Wardley or someone else. Um, is that we've been talked to that yet soon, German that's coming? I hope so. I think I feel like the only the only step for me now, the heavyweight division is thin. I either go jump up a step and box someone who's probably fringe world level, mm -hmm. or in this country, there's only really Adelaide and Wardley who who else I could box. I don't think I can box anyone else because I think I'll get ripped to shreds. If I go and box another domestic guy now, I'd, would you say that Dave Allen's probably been around the most out of the domestic lads probably not the best because I think Wardley and Adelaide are the, de the definite next all three are there I think it has to be one of them it has mm. to be I, that's what I feel anyway and would you like to fight someone like that before someone who's more experienced like a Joyce or even a Dubois yeah you know I, I know I know my I know where I can go but I know where I'm at at the minute do you know what I mean and the experience the ball's just boxed Usyk and I think he did, despite what everyone said, I think he did all right. I think he, you know, pat on the back to that young man for going out there 25 years old and, and doing what he did. I think he didn't do bad at all. They're probably definitely massive fights, but down the line a little bit, yeah. The reality is to be successful, you need people around you, don't you, who are mm -hmm. good. That, like a high tide rose, rises all boats. Look at Muhammad Ali and the, the era he was in. Yeah. You got a crazy era, even just in this country, the the talent at your sort of age and level is is beyond anything we've had before in this country. Yeah, I think it's a really good, really good mix, a really good scene. And I think it's, obviously, you'll know about the business, George, as a, and you all will, but people have got to shake their heads and we've got to get fights made, haven't we? Do you know what I mean? And I know it's it's rich coming from me. After the purse bid, I, I can't even say nothing. I can't even say nothing. You know why? Because yeah. I just get ripped. Well, you pulled out this. Remember, I didn't pull out of anything, but I would love... I'd love us all to box each other, even in a massive tournament or something like that. You know, I think obviously you've got the top boys that are probably obviously Fury and Joshua. And then if you chuck everyone else in the mix, you've got, you got a hell of a good fights. Mm. Mm. Who do you think had a better rise to the top? Um, Fury or Joshua? In term, like in fact, everything and not just like money and fame. I think Joshua, I think it was one of the best matchmaking periods of British boxing. I think between Rob, Eddie, and whoever else was involved at that time, strategically put him in good fights at good times. And I've had this conversation again. <laughs> I feel like that was all obviously pre-COVID. There was good opponents. That the, the division isn't as thick as it was then. There's not them opponents about now. That's why... I've took a lot of criticism over the people I've boxed because them opponents aren't there, you know, like Kevin Johnson, Kevin Johnson, like yeah, um, Matt Leg. He, he boxed Joshua, boxed some real good, not big threats, but good names on the way up, <coughs> and he he made a demolition job of him. He was at one point it was like knockout real, wasn't it? Do you mm. know what I mean? Mm. Have you sparred Moses and Talma? Seems to have sparred everyone. No, I've not sparred him. I've not sparred him. Um, but yeah, he's. I've seen him. Well, I've not seen him spar. I've heard of him sparring and. Dangerous boy. Mm. Do you think he's coming? What is he? He's only 18. 18. Like, you remember what you were doing when you were 18? What, what were you up to? Yeah, I was on, I was on GB them times. Yeah, Just yeah. Uh, uh, 18, I was at the Commonwealth Feds in India, boxing Joe Parker. Oh, yeah. Boxed Joe Parker in the semi-final, yeah. And lost. So, I think he's a huge talent. But I do understand when they say about, you know, um, heavyweights maturing a little bit older and um, just, just finding, I think, I think, I think they had ambitions of being like the youngest heavyweight champion in the world, but I think personally they should scrap that and just, if they move him correctly, he, he's definitely capable. Mm. Should we go feature? Let's do it. George, remind me again, how I become an elite club member? Well, get a GGBC cap. Done. What else? Well, you could wear the hoodie. Anything else? Well, have you got a water bottle? <sighs> Anything else? You could get a print for the wall. It's cost me a fortune. Anything else? Well, this is what it takes to be elite, Deck. Does that mean I'm in the club now? Nearly. One last thing. Just hit the follow button in your podcast app. Welcome to the club, Deck. Oh, we'll have a push in the pool, mate. We have a feature every week, mate, with our guests. 
generally a quiz generally um, always always a quiz <laughs> right uh we 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 knocked about the the feature name this week mm -hmm. So it's usually a play on words of the of the guest, which is uh, Fraser Clark. I can't say the word Fraser, yeah, can yeah, I? So I'll panic. Fraser. So I've gone Clark, right? So I had <laughs> Disney, Clark's Tale. No. Poor. Clarky and George. Nice. We've had that for, for yeah. Sharky there. Phil yeah, Sharky. We've had, it's been, it's been beaten Sharky. already, yeah. yeah. Uh, Noah's Clark. A no, bit rubbish. religious element though. What'd you go for? Um, well, this was Roscoe. Came in with uh, producer Ross. A shot in the Clark. Yeah, like it. Shot in the dark, shot in the clock, yeah. And I thought the shot, is it a punch? No, it's not. It's going to be wild, unsubstantiated guesses, right? Boxing related quiz. Go on. Do you want to go first or second, mate? Second. Second, right. Here we go, right. Declan, mm. right. How many people in total are reported to have watched Royal, uh, to have watched Rumble in the Jungle live on TV or there in the sort of stadium How many arena? People? How many people watched it? Fucking Actually, it's not you go, I go. It's you're both going in. Oh, okay, we'll both have yeah, a go. Yeah, yeah. We'll Closest wins. Stat, yeah, yeah. okay. I'm going to say 50 million. I'm going to say 100 million. It's reported a billion people <laughs> a billion. watch closed circuit and uh, free TV. That's quarter of the world's Who population. Who a billion? Who said that? That's I impossible. didn't count. That's what they said. One in four well, people watched I'm not it. That. I'm no, uh, one in four. What about babies? They were all asleep. Half of them in the world. Anyway, <laughs> fine. That's one nil. But I'm not right. having that. Second a billion question. people. It's a big fight, but come on. Rocky Marciano's career highest purse is reported to have come <laughs> against Archie Moore in 1955. What was his purse? A million quid. <laughs> I'm going to say 800 grand. Goes to big phrase, yeah. Oh. Uh, $468,374. Nice. Uh, and he beats uh, more in ninth round. That's 2-0 to right. you. Yeah, Fucking right. right under. The Amplin Alp, uh, Primo Carrero, uh, who fought Italian, uh, an Italian, he fought between 1928 and 1946, right, in heavyweight division. What's he called? The Ambling Alp? Yeah. Is he? It's nice, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, right, he's got the record for the most amount of KO victories in the heavyweight division. Oh. What is his record? Primo Carnera. Yeah. Drop percentage or number? No, no, what number? How many knockouts did he have? 43. 61. 71. Oh. 71. 71 knockouts. 71 yeah. knockouts Big and 88 Primo. wins. Do you not know him? Yeah, Primo, the Ambling Alp, I know him well. Absolutely he, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, beat, he beat Jack Sharkey. Big Primo, yeah. Uh, win the world title, but Good he lost fire. it to Max Bear. He did. The, a year yeah. later, yeah. Right, what is the... Three what, right, here we go, right. What was the weight difference between champion Andy Ruiz... <laughs> <laughs> and challenger Anthony Joshua in their rematch for the heavyweight world title. Oh, that's good. How many pounds, oh, pounds. was the difference oh, between you, the you're two? You're not working pounds. pounds like do this. I reckon he was. I reckon he was four stone heavier. Joshua about seventeen stone. Ruiz about 21, 20. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go forty pounds. All right. I'm gonna go forty-one pounds. <laughs> 46 and a half no, pounds. There we go. Yeah. Um, That's good. Yeah, That's he weighed in at 283 yeah, and a half pounds. Big boys because he had that stuff under his He, under he his, put uh, on over it. a stone. Yeah, and Joshua yeah. dropped 10 pounds actually. So that was... Right, Iron Mike bikes. Tyson is the youngest heavyweight champion in yeah. history and he achieved this feat at the age of 20. But how many days old was he when he won the belt? 20 times 365. <laughs> <laughs> oh... How many days old was he when he won the belt? That's like 600,000 or something. 600,000. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a sec. He was 20 years, four months, yeah, and like 21 talking. days. 7,100. I'm going to go 7,400. Yeah, 7,450. <laughs> oh, I lost a 50. Not bad, not bad. Right. How many IBO World Heavyweight Champions there been? <laughs> Since his first one IBO in 1992. World, world heavyweight champions. Yeah, world heavyweight champions, IBO. 92. Is that, the, 92. Is that like, not the terrible belt, because I'd take it. That's the green one. Is it, yeah, yeah. But the uh, other uh, slightly darker green one. Yeah. It's the fifth belt. Mm. Uh, 92. Yeah. I'm going to go, 
I can probably Newbie add. pro, he doesn't know what IBF yeah. is. <laughs> no, I've seen it. But he's going to sk- he's going to skip past. It's them. not a WBC or IBF or yeah. you know. So you don't really. I'm going to go twenty four. Eighteen. Mm-hmm. Twelve. Fucking hell. So landslide. Yeah. Yeah, includes Joshua, Fury, Klitschko, yeah, Lewis, course, and of course, Pinkland Thomas. Mm. Who won it first, yeah. South Carolina. I was going to say right, that. last question Come since it's flight, not even a fucking up. tiebreaker, is it? Right. Former British heavyweight world champion David Hay has a synonymous ring walk tune. McFadden and Whitehead. Ain't no stopping me now. At That's the not. time of recording... How many streams has this song had on Spotify? Shout out Spotify. Shout out Spotify every time. Uh, I think it's had 270 million streams. More. I'm going to say. More? Yeah. Easy. I'd say. <laughs> I'd say. 500 million. Well, it's weirdly, there's, the song comes up twice, so I <laughs> added them together, and it was 48 million. Oh, easy. 320,982. Yeah. Oh, I thought it would have been more. Yeah, yeah it should have been more. It was, it was, well, that's a landslide. Uh, maybe. That's another win. What, is that 9-0 and o now you are? Yeah, we'll that's probably that. a stoppage Put as well. Put the BSBs in there as well. We're 18-0. Yeah. And, 18 and 0. yeah. <laughs> World title shot, please. There's only one that matters, though. What's the, so what's the next, just before we close, what's the next, what's what's idea, what's the next fight? Do you really? want the British title? 100%. Is that, do you want it especially because of what happened in the, with that person bit situation? I want to prove everyone wrong, yeah. Mm. I, I, I can't sleep at night knowing people think that I, I Fraser Clark, would, would have pulled out of that fight and I want to see, I want to prove to them why I wouldn't have. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have to become big, 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 horrible phrase, I think. <laughs> let people know that that can't happen again. Wiki, babe. Well, before you go, we cannot forget. Oh yeah, fuck. We, I'm sorry, we, would, um, we would love if you could add your chosen track of a ring walk tune to add to our playlist we've got a playlist on spotify Ooh. and every one of our guests gives us a play uh gives us a uh, a track it doesn't have to be the one you've got now or maybe one for the future maybe just I, a gym I banger my next one is going to be billy ocean red light spells danger oh, yeah i think next time because I've been listening to it on, yeah, on like, Friday. That had a little bit of a resurgence. I think it was around the England football team. I seem to hear that song a bit more nowadays than I ever did. Um, I, it's a great I, one. I've been in Benidorm last week and it was absolutely was go, it? it was absolutely going off. So yeah. I thought, you know what? <laughs> You're going to wear red one. shorts on oh, that as well? Yeah, I'm going to have to. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Fraser Clark's in the, in the club. He is. Officially. Thanks so much for coming Perfect. in, pal. Really appreciate Cheers. it.